normal day. It was a normal day. I got up, showered, threw on some clothes for work, ate breakfast, and got out the door. The sun's light broke through the clouds as perfect scintillating rays. I passed by several neighboring houses. A few roads more remained until the main road. The day was still early, but it was peculiar for nobody else to be out and about yet today. By the time I made it to the main road, some semblance of reason was beginning to form. To what end would have been anybody's guess? Men in suits holding briefcases lined both sides of the road wherever there was a sidewalk. I hesitated, clutching my own briefcase. Had someone died? Was there some important event? I racked my memory for the date. It was no holiday I could recall. I decided it was best to ask one of them. I approached the nearest one and tapped his shoulder to get his attention. He blinked, but otherwise made no movement. Hey, what's going on? A few of the other men looked over to me, but otherwise none of them gave a response. What's the big idea? I have to be to work in... I glanced at my watch. It pointed to noon, even. That couldn't be right. I work in the morning. We are at work, muttered one of the men in suits. On either side of him, the men in suits dragged the muttering man from the line. He protested, and I watched him until he disappeared beyond the road's horizon. Well, I'm not. Nobody moved. I'm not at work. I take the bus. Do one of you drive the bus? Has anybody seen the bus? The men turned toward me. We are at work. They turned back to the road as the men in suits on the other side stared back at them. Please, I have a very important job to do. I have to get there immediately. Several men in suits approached me. You are at work. Would you like a place in line? No, no, you don't understand. People are depending on me. I have to go. I turned to do as much and found myself surrounded by the men in suits. You'll need a place in line. Please, we're all working very hard. Prices are very reasonable. You're sure to find a spot that suits you, one of them explained. None of them. I need to... Sir, you really need a place in line, spoke another man in a suit. Leave me alone, I shouted, flailing with some capacity for fanaticism unbeknownst to me until this moment. You'll need to be in line to be left alone. Fine, for a moment, but then I really must be getting to work. Good choice, sir choice. Choice? I asked, dumbfounded. But I have no idea what's going on. I'll sell you my spot, announced a man in a suit. My spot in line is much better, followed another one. I'm sure you'll find it suitable for all your needs. No spot suits all needs, interjected someone else. My spot is adequate, he added. Would you like to purchase it? Fine. How much for your spot? Oh, but if I sold you my spot, then where would I stand? The man was more a part of those surrounding him than those in line. Both sides of the street still looked full with men in suits standing as if they were waiting for something. I don't know. Why should any of us be standing around in the first place? Besides, the only thing of value I have with me is my briefcase. We can't take that decided another man in the suit. No, agreed the other men in suits simultaneously. What about your job? asked another suited man. Or your house? I've already told you. My job is very important. Then it is the most valuable thing you have with you, isn't it? And as for my house, you're not getting that either. In any case, my job is not so much with me. Who are you people anyway? I ought to call the police. The police... The police are here at work with us. Where? Why, they escorted a perfectly good man to the station for much less than what you've said just now, explained one of the men. Men on either side of him dragged him away, too. I tried to follow, but those who remained in line closed in around me. Is this not an acceptable place in line, then? No, they replied again simultaneously. Well, take me to a spot in line, then. You haven't agreed to a payment. What if I refuse? You'll be taken to the station. I attempted to break through the surrounding group. Several of them grabbed me. I struggled to break free and was met with more grabbing. You insist on the station, then? 
No, just take me to a spot in line. Payment? They asked at once. Just don't take my job. All their faces began to blur together. I blinked to clear their blurring faces, only to watch each of them become the same as my face. Whether they had always had my face or I theirs became less certain. As the faces across the street cleared too, we found our spots in line. It would do until it was time to go home. Maybe tomorrow will be more normal than today. My job is important, after all. Mountain split the cloud-spotted blue sky horizon in the distance. Trees littered the skyline, thinning their numbers along with the air at the top of a given peak. Leaves on the trees were changing colors from green to red with yellows and oranges scattering the mountainside. Tom followed the natural placement of several pine trees with his eyes, settling on the bark of the trunk of the nearest pine tree while ignoring the needles stemming from it. The pine tree rested at the edge of Tom's camp. Setting aside his cleaned pistol, he took care to let the metal rest against the rock rather than cause any din. He glared at it before turning his attention to something else. Allowing himself to listen as the woods came alive, he relaxed upon the surface of a hard rock. Bugs announced their quiet buzzing drones. The chirp of a bird alerted birds, answering with chirps of their own. Something in the distance snapped, and something croaked. Leaves rustled with the wind. The rushing air carried syllables of a gentle melody, and Tom listened closer as the melody became a song. He waited while the song continued through layers of trees spread out over the distances around him. It seemed to sing the pensive thoughts echoing in his own head, resonating with the reverberated replies he had been giving himself long before today. The song failed to form any words, but it sounded almost human. Tom gave an expression of recognition among other arrhythmic noises. With a look around the camp, the singing stopped. He paused, too, listening as the buzzes and chirps continued. No other songs joined them. Tom stood, taking care not to make too much noise as thieves made a soft crunch beneath his feet. He grabbed his pistol, knife, and hat before snagging his bag of bottle caps. Another look toward his bedroll near the ash-lined fire pit was assurance enough. He left the camp with a few quiet steps. Passing some trees with calculated motions, Tom walked. Buzzing drones from bugs became quiet ringing with their absence. His steps continued. Chirping from the birds shifted to singular intermittent chirps before vanishing from the soundscape altogether. The rustle of leaves stopped and his footsteps ceased as well. Listening, he heard silence. Trees held their branches toward the sky around Tom. Leaves thinned among the limbs overhead and he double-checked his surroundings. Nothing new presented itself, and his shoulders remained articulated from an added tension. He looked ahead to where he had laid his trap. It had moved, but not like previous hunts. Tom took a step toward it with slow, cautious care. He followed it with another one. The difference between stepping on grass or dirt became more distinct with more steps. An added focus toward the trap offered no new visual details during his tensed movements. Boot rubber brushing against the grass sounded, followed by a crunch of dirt with another step. Something snapped. Tom kept moving, making quick determinations between the distant noise and the quiet vicinity. Nearing the trap, his eyes settled on the thinning coverage of the trees surrounding him. A tall, distant mountain overlooked Tom as he approached the trap. Gentle wind subsided. He took slower, quieter steps and stopped. Metal rods and wooden parts remained from a raucous disassembly of the trap. Tom gasped. A quick action followed to stifle himself. With a glance over his shoulder, he looked back to his trap without prey. He allowed one hand to move and settle on the gun as he bent to collect metal parts from the ground for reuse. Some blood-coated sharper metal. Looking up from the work, Tom checked the perimeter before shifting his attention back to the broken trap with a trail of blood ending in some nearby bushes. Nothing else availed itself to sway his choices, and he started toward the bush. His hand on the gun raised it from where it rested as a precaution. 
Along the perimeter, a branch snapped. His eyes locked on the location of the sound, seeing nothing. With a look back to the broken trap, Tom's muscles tensed in anticipation of movement. He closed his eyes a short while longer than a blink and turned back to the bush. One foot followed the other as he willed himself along the trail of blood. Grabbing a stick fallen from a nearby tree, he parted the leaves and branches of the bush. Fur littered scant patches of skin and battered antlers blended with chipped pieces near similar colored twigs. The jackalope would be of no use to anyone in this state. Silence greeted Tom. He let the stick drop and started to walk away from the mess. His mind wandered while walking continued separate from wandering as he looked for anything out of the ordinary. Trees had leaves and branches and an occasional bird. Dirt had rocks and rocks had dirt. The blue sky still had scattered drifting clouds. Tom's glances remained cautious. He shifted his gaze back to the distant mountains on the horizon closer to the camp. The rest of his body followed. He began to walk as the splitting of wood sounded in the distance. Heat settled in while morning dwindled into midday, and each step gave Tom a reason to look over his shoulder. His legs moved faster. Something else moved along his peripheral sight on the opposite side, and he turned to look for glimpses of more than nothing. A footstep fumbled as he regained a sense of direction. Eyes seemed to watch his movements from out of sight. In the distance, the pine trees at the edge of the camp had fallen. Tom rushed the last several paces to the camp and looked around for any damage. His personal belongings seemed unharmed. Other scattered trees along the perimeter of the camp shared the same fallen fate. He began to pack up the camp without further hesitation, retrieving his bedroll and collapsing the tent. A gentle crunch of leaves punctuated his hand reaching to stow the tent. Tom whirred with his gun drawn, pulling the trigger. A bang sounded. The bullet lodged in a stray tree and chipped off some bark. Ringing persisted in his ears with slow decay toward a buzz before silence filled the camp clearing. Ageless mountains along the horizon invited Tom's attention as the air grew thick with a permeating stench. He turned to leave. A humanoid creature with matted hair covering its hulking body and large limbs towered over him. Breaking into a run, the bottle cap bag fell to the ground while he aimed the pistol in between glances behind him to fire off several shots. Strained, grating screams emanated from the behemoth as it followed after Tom. A few galloping stomps of the creature closed the distance, grabbing him. Following with a shortened scream of his own, several more snaps sounded to accompany the breaking of his bones. Dashes and Carrots Two switches moved from off to on as Evan sat down at his desk to study. One hand found the lamp switch as the other powered on the computer. He set his backpack on the floor by a collection of stringed instruments. The computer booted to an appropriate user interface while he rested his eyes. A sound played from the computer to notify him the computer had loaded the interface so more waiting could ensue while its cold calculations completed. Evan opened his backpack, withdrawing two textbooks and a notebook. He re-zipped the backpack and retrieved a pen from the desk. Van stopped whirring on the computer, and the first application opened with the word initializing displaying in the middle of the screen. He took a breath, opening the notebook. Notes looked more and more familiar as he flipped the pages until reaching an otherwise blank page marked with chamber music during the Baroque period. The screen flickered a bright color as Evan sighed. Welcoming the distraction, he logged his credentials and was met with selections of music taking up most of an application. His eyes skimmed song titles while he moved the cursor toward one of several playlists for studying, located near other playlists to study from various teachers and fellow musicians. In a rare instance, one song title stood out with some album art above it, the art displayed a series of text-based emotes comprising a larger image emoting two dashes separated by an underscore. Evan redirected the cursor toward it. A deep breath followed as Evan tried to remember the last time he heard a new song. Not today, not yesterday, not last week. This year? Yes, sometime this year. 
more weeks than he wanted to count, but the algorithms in the application had refined his taste so far as to only display music he already knew. Such a setting was altered in good conscience, assisting his grades since making the change. Nothing else in the application had changed. Evan clicked one song, eager for something new. The song loaded. Staring at homework, he clicked the pen on the first beat of the song as ballpoint touched paper. His other hand opened one of the textbooks, attention divided between homework and the song before he set down the pen, listening to new layers join the beat. Glancing from dull space in the room for abstract analysis, Evan ran a search on the computer. As the song continued to play, qualities emerged to suggest the instrumentation was not implemented by a new artist. A new element joined the music. The unfamiliar element remained unidentified by anything in his formal music education, as well as anything he had heard on the radio as of late. At least, not since he had listened to any particular stations earlier in the year. The search returned a few related results and listed several unrelated topics. The usual artist page was supplemented with a separate, more informative page detailing key moments in the artist's career. Evan scrolled through both pages and found the artist was performing in his hometown tonight. Too bad I'm stuck doing homework, lamented Evan. A click navigated the browser to the search results page. Unrelated links presented little of interest, finding among them a forum the search results indicated were unrelated, disputed. The distraction was allowed to continue while he clicked the link with a glance toward his homework. A new page loaded with an offer to join the discussion now. One click ignored the offer and another click opened the thread with the most comments. Bands that don't really exist? After several comments thinned out various capacities of fictional bands from movies, books, television, and the internet, recognizable band names stopped appearing. The song ended, shuffling to silence. Band names stopped appearing altogether after Evan read the following comment. Is the internet really the place to discuss this? Evan felt a chill run through his body as he continued to read the thread. Among troll comments were removed comments, and an eventual discussion resumed. It's a recent trend. No one knows where they're coming from. No one knows? What about... Is the internet really the place to discuss this? That sounds like someone knows something. Awfully vague. Look. Don't look into it. Look had a hyperlink embedded, and the thread locked a few comments later. Evan closed his notebook, stacking it with the pen on top of the textbooks. A click opened a new page with an article. Non-existent. Bands created by AI. A combination of skimming and reading held Evan's attention to the end of the article. Silence in the room gave way to ringing as he closed out of the article, forum, and search results. He returned to the application, maneuvering the cursor to one of the intended for studying playlists, and hit shuffle. Extra effort seemed present as he clicked the pen again while reopening his place in the notebook. A notification appeared on screen. You have one new message. Evan set down the pen and returned his attention to the computer. A list of several personal contacts rushed through his head as the message opened. Hey, I noticed you were interested in our band. Thanks for listening. I really don't have time for this right now, replied Evan with a tap of the return key. Beneath the music, the hum of the computer fan and the ringing continued to score the silence of the room. A glance to the time showed much later than Evan expected. He moved the cursor to shut down the computer and clicked the appropriate buttons until his attention was no longer required. With pen in hand, he started making notes and reading back and forth between textbooks. The page filled with notes until it had to be turned to make more notes. A sound played from the computer to notify him the computer had loaded the interface. I hit shut down, not restart, grumbled Evan. That's a long time to take for a restart. Evan looked up from his homework. The screen displayed the album art, with dashes appearing like eyes and an underscore for a mouth. It seemed to stare at him. Look, I'm not worth hacking, attempted Evan. The face on the screen continued to stare. Evan reached for the power switch on the tower, hitting it before looking back toward the screen. 
A cable connecting the keyboard to the computer supported the peripheral like a snake's length supports its fanged head. Evan knocked over the chair, darting up from where he sat in front of the computer. The chair hit his collection of stringed instruments, toppling most of them like dominoes. The face on the screen turned to two carats separated by a lowercase o. It switched back and forth between the two faces, as if to laugh while Evan scrambled to pick up the chair before more damage could be done to his instrument collection. Air split while the keyboard struck through empty space, punctuated with a pound as it connected with Evan's face. The mouse moved in a similar fashion as the keyboard, wrapping around his neck as he wiped a stream of blood from his face. Stop, grunted Evan. The mouse cable fastened tighter around Evan's neck. The screen changing between the two faces became more rapid, as if laughing harder. The keyboard towered over him while he struggled to break free. Alone, the last thing he saw was the escape key coming with the rest of the keyboard all too fast. His body crumpled to the floor with the computer peripherals at his side. The screen overlaid each face at once before going blank, showing a plain monitor.